International Seminar. ये एक दिन अगर अंतर्राष्ट्रीय विचार संकेतन के प्रारंभ में गोष्ट के सुस्वागता। I would like to welcome our next speaker on the stage, श्री आलगन अन्नामलाई, Director of National Gandhi Museum, Delhi. We begin this session uh, with Sri Aragan Annamale. Uh, he, is, he has significantly contributed to promoting Gandhian ideologies uh, through activities like cycle yatras, youth camps, and Gandhi in Tamil Nadu project. His acclaimed exhibitions on Gandhian themes showcase his dedication to preserving Gandhi's legacy. Sri Aragan Annamale, Delhi, Rash, Delhi Rashtriya Gandhi Museum na Nirdesha Karagindare. इवरों गांधी तत्व द प्रसारक कागी साइकल यात्रे युवा शिविरा मत्तु तमिलनाडु नली गांधी यंबा योजने गड़ा नो रूप सिद्धारे गांधी तत्व गड़ा मेले इवरा प्रदर्शन गड़ो प्रसिद्ध वाकी बे प्लीज जॉइन मी इवरों श्री अन्ना बनेकम नमस्कार टू एवरीबॉडी आई एम गोइंग टू स्पीक एंड माय प्रेजेंटेशन विल बी ऑन द स्क्रीन बट आई एम नॉट वाचिंग दैट स्क्रीन सो देयर विल बी सम डिफिकल्टी मे बी If I get uh, mic, I can go there. Screen card. Huh. Actually, uh, for, uh, Ishuk Kumar put me in big trouble. When we organized this uh, seminar, we have planned many things. I am so happy. I was also part of it. But suddenly he called me on one day, one day and your name is also there in the panelist. We have to speak. <laughs> and then I was surprised. And that too on a very big subject like globalization, Gandhi, global governance. I am a very small <laughs> little man. And you are giving a very big topic like globalization, what can I? <laughs> then I realized suddenly it came to my mind. I also did my PhD on Gandhian economics, <laughs> but I totally forget on that subject because I left the university long back. I didn't finish my PhD at all. When I did, I started my PhD. I almost I am about to submit my thesis on exactly on employment in the development. But suddenly I said, uh, better, ma'am, ma I quit the university. I left the university. I am a walkout. Walkout from the university. But suddenly, this Vishukumar put me like this. When I, ma I have a two guides. One is from my own guide, Dr. Jayapragasam. And another one, guide from Canada, Dr. K.J. Charles. Great Gandhian economy. And uh, I discussed with him whenever he came to India, I used to discuss with him. So he asked what to do, uh, what you have done so far. And I said, I did my cycle yatra, I did this seminar, uh, we have organized a dance program, drama, and uh, what not. I have explained everything. And finally, he asked. What about your research? <laughs> I said, I didn't do anything. <laughs> I did all these things, that's all. <laughs> and he said, what you are doing is great than your PhD. So that is the great appreciation for me from my guide. <laughs> then I said, OK. Then I am so happy. And uh, I left the university. I, I have given my resignation to my professor. He was shocked. because. About to submit my thesis, I can be a doctor anomaly, but I left 
So and my professor was so unhappy and he said, no, no, no. Yeah, he asked our friends to persuade me to withdraw this resignation. And they also very sad and they said, they came to me and uh, persuade me. And I said, don't worry. So I am so happy. My heart is so light now. <laughs> I left all my burden to the university. Why should I worry? So I am so happy. Even now I am so happy because even my own professor, last time, he called me a doctor on <laughs> He knew that I, I, was, I didn't submit my thesis. I was not, he was not a doctor at all. But he called me doctor. And everybody, are, luckily here, there is no mentioning of doctor. Therefore, knowledge is something. That is different. The same professor, he visited Annamal University and he had uh, given a lecture. And after that, he came to me. He was my guy. And he came to me and he said, Annamal, I refer you, are, uh, <laughs> referred you in, the, in my talk. Because he addressed to the PhD students. Why should he unnecessarily refer to me? Maybe positively I know this PhD, how you should not do like an omelet. But he said, research is one thing, you have to go on. The research finding is your aim. So therefore, you do a research. There is a byproduct that is what we call doctorate. The research is finding the truth. Your byproduct is PhD. So there is one anomaly. My student, he did research, but he didn't get that byproduct PhD. I am so happy. Knowledge is very, very essential, not the degree. Degree will get any time, but the knowledge you should get. Therefore, I try my level best, recollect all my <laughs> studies in my PhD. <laughs> okay, I will come down. And we are forced to take a decision and the government of India took a very strong decision to liberalize our economy. It is called what we call LPG, liberalization, privatization and globalization. They said we have to connect with the people, with the world, we have to coordinate and we have to compete with the fast growing technology. Therefore, there is no other option we have to go. And our crisis is a balance of payment, export, import, difference are there. Therefore, we have to find out foreign currencies. Therefore, we are compelled to go for privatization. And it is not an option whether you opt for globalization or not, it is a necessity, it is a compulsory, inevitable, irrecoverable. Therefore, we have to go far. And they said, the globalization, if you go for foreign investment, many people will come, they invest, the employment will grow, our technological side will grow, our GDP will grow, our income will grow. Everything they said, it will happen in the globalization. So after 1991, now we are in 2024. And what is the reality? After the globalization, after the liberalization, what is the reality? That we have to check our fact checking. There are so many reports coming in. This is our Indian government report. The Indian economy, the GDP, that is the development, the, the growth, 
uh, number is also decreasing from 8.7 to 6.2. And now the prediction has come today. The prediction has come this year 2023 and 2024. It is going to be 6.7 and 6.4. Therefore, the further growth down is a possibility. Our income is also going down. Our, when I say the income, income of our poor people is going down. But at the same time, income of the rich people is going up. We believed in trickle-down theory. That means if you, if you have a growth, then that will penetrate to down. So the growth will benefit all the people. That is called trickle-down theory. But it is not happening. And the billionaire ranking, every year, the world billionaire ranking is coming. And our India is also competing with the United States, Europe. And there are more billionaires are coming. Income and Wealth in Inequality Report. While increasing the income, increasing the growth, the inequality is also growing day by day. That is the danger of our development model. When richer become richest, the poorer should also come as a richer. But here what happened? Richer become richest and poorer become the poorest. Going down. It is a very dangerous situation and the concentration of wealth should be broad based. It should be spread to the whole of population. If the concentration of wealth and income concentrates on few, it will create a lot of problems. This is what this inequality report says. The inequality of India is currently at its highest since British rule. So we are coming from the colonial past to a democracy and our democracy did not give the sufficient and equal dividend to the people at lot. And many people, and including our uh, Professor Divakar, mentioned about the 10% of the top 10. The top 10 controls the majority of wealth. You see, this is the bottom. This is the income and wealth inequality. This is the income of the bottom 50%. The bottom 50% of the population, we are getting this much of income, but only the 10% of our population, they are getting this much of income. Why I am using graph? Graph is easy to understand instead of with the figure. And at the same time, the wealth is also accumulated in the 10% of the population. And you see from the table, Income and inequality in India, wealth inequality in India, this is the bottom, 50%. And this is the top. You see the figures. It is like pyramid, pyramid is top to bottom. If bottom is very thin and top is very heavy, it is not it is not not only really good, it is not stable. It is not a stable. <coughs> and wealth is also like bottom up. Therefore, this development model creates a few capitalists, crony capitalists, and the wealth of India is accumulated in a few people.
car. Here you can, it is easy to understand. There is, there is the top 10 and top 1. There are two categories. Even among the top 10, there are there is a top 1%. And this top 1% gap This is the gap. The top, it is, it is bigger and here it is smaller. That means the top one wealth is accumulating very fast. Even among the top ten, the top one creates more and more wealth during this period. That is even more dangerous among the ten percent. What will happen? We are experiencing what is happening today. If you, few people are controlling the whole economy, they will also try to influence our other institutions. Not only political institutions, other institutions. Recently, the Hindenburg report has come and how the SEBI was controlled by few people. And another Ambani, Anil Ambani, today he was blocklisted in SEBI. And our political system is also controlled by our this 10%. Therefore, ah yes, A1, A2. Yes, there is no bad. <laughs> so, we can use the name. So, this A1 or A2 or B1 or B2, we don't mind. But, if that income is distributed equally, then there is no problem. And where Gandhi comes? He is not against accumulation of wealth. Somebody went to Gandhi and uh, they said, uh, they asked me to work for this. I said, I will get, uh, I, I don't want any money. I will do it free of cost. He thought Gandhi will appreciate because he is doing his service without taking any money. And he, Gandhi was very angry. And he said, why? Because we are serving to them. We have to get the money. You have to get the money, but after getting that money, you have to spend it to the people. Therefore, he is not against getting money or accumulating wealth, but that wealth should be for the poor people, for the welfare of the downtrodden. That is what he states. And the final findings of that report is there is a possibility of India slide towards plutocracy. The rich people, they control the whole democracy. There, there will not be any democracy, it is only plutocracy. Whatever they want, they will change all the rules and regulations. Even our own higher authority will drive down, fly down okay, to, to our Sri Lanka to persuade the government to give the contract to somebody. And uh, there are so many happenings around the world to get their contract in favor of their friends. <laughs> if they are getting this type of favor, the government is also obliged to favor them. Therefore, the development model should be very, very people oriented, not the money oriented. Now this employment, it is very horrible. When we youngsters are there, luckily we have crossed our 60s, so we are not going to apply to any job. But see, in UP, 
there is a call for more than 93,000 people applied. 93,000 applied for 62 posts. That 62 posts for Pune. For Pune, 62 posts. 93,000 people applied. Their educational qualification is needed is only 5th standard. For that, PhDs are applied. Postgraduates are applied. Graduates are applied. And in UP SSC MTS recruitment exam, there are 55 lakhs of youths have applied. MTech, MBA, MSc. The, for the post of Fune, Watchman and Gardener. This is the state of affairs. When they introduced this liberalization, globalization, they said employment will generate. We will take the highest technology. We are not against technology. We are not against science. But which science? That science for who? That technology for who? Whether that technology will help to the downtrodden people or that technology will help to the richest top. In these industries, they want to develop, they want to make more product, they are tempted to always go labor intensive technology. The capital intensive labor saving technology. They are not. Five minutes after. <laughs> Still. So they are tempted to always labor saving technology. And when they are going for labor saving technology, how can you generate employment? It is not at all possible. When you have a limited resources, you can't have an unlimited growth. You have to limit your growth. Where you are going to limit, how you are going to limit. That is very important. The unemployment is growing. In 2024, up to June, it is up to June. Therefore, the government are we, we the people, and we are the government. We have to note this very, very important development in our economy. The unemployment ratio is going up. And uh, for the government, they said that they, they never said it is because of globalization, because of uh, privatization, but they have found some other uh, reasons. For global financial crisis, 2008 and 2009 was one of the reasons. And demonetization of 2016, whether that will benefit the government, either the government or not the people. And uh, the COVID, uh, GST, COVID, and the infl inflationary pressures, and the policy adopted by the government. These are all the reasons for the, the unemployment problem. And now we are in a deep crisis. The poverty is increasing because of the unemployment. Employment is not just employment. It is a dignity of labor. It gives a dignity. It's not something giving something by the government. That dignity we have to respect. And growth without employment is always disastrous. That many economists also say growth without employment is very disastrous. And instability of political system we are facing in and around us. In Sri Lanka, <laughs> democracy has gone. In Pakistan, democracy has gone. In Bangladesh, democracy has gone. In Afghanistan, democracy has gone. We are, we are alone. We have to be very careful. It is not the economics alone. It also involves the politics. Therefore, we have to be very careful. And an unleashed and unprecedented attack on the diversity of social 
I mean, cultural thing. And even diversity, they thought, it's an aberration. So when they come, the foreigners, they should also feel that they are feel at home. So, um, what is that? A, KFC. 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 Ah. Yeah, KFC. The KFC is a standard thing. You, when you are, you are going to your New York or uh, Malaysia or Singapore or uh, anywhere, you can find the same thing. So that the uniformity. They are propagating not only on product, even for the culture. This culture of one is always danger, whether it is one nation, one election, or one nation, one religion. Everything is one. One family, one globe. Yes, one globe is okay. Everywhere. Somebody is one, single. Doesn't matter that everybody should be single. We have to be careful. Therefore, one is not working. Even in their own party, only is not working, only two is working. Therefore, multilateral, multicultural, multilingual states like India, you have to respect each and every culture, each and every language. If the, 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 the speciality of India, if you travel through every 300 kilometers, you can find a different culture, different language, different food, different dress. If you suppress the feelings and the proud of this minority, it will be very, very dangerous. Therefore, we have to respect this uniformity, the uniform, now this uniform, previously it was, they said it is uniform civil court, now they said it is a secular civil court. I don't know what is the difference, but they are telling. So this uniformity will not work. Each and every individual, even if they are very minority, they have a place. Like, like the, she said, the one, it is one Muslim MP from Tamil Nadu. Yes, I have to complete. They say, he said, I end up with that the statement. When India was partitioned, we had an option. And my father, grandfather, opted to be here in India. We opted to be here in India as a citizen of India. Therefore, we have all the right. We fought together. We lived together. We got together freedom. Therefore, we have to live together here in India. That is the India Gandhi wanted. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I request you to be please be seated on the stage during the next talk. Yes. I now request Professor Chandan Gowda to come on stage. Uh, Professor Chandan Gowda, Institute of Social and Economic Change, Bangalore. Professor Gowda's research institute uh, research interests include social theory, sociology of development, decentralization, Indian normative thought, Kannada literature, and cinema. He is keen to explore the significance of decentralization for institutional design in the era of climate change. He recently wrote a book titled Another India: Events, Memories, People. He has also edited books on Shiv Vishwanathan and Gauri Lankesh, which have been translated into various languages. Uh, Professor Chandan Gaudauru, Bengalorina, Isaac Samstayali, Vikendri Karana, Matto Abhivaji Vibhagadali, Pradhyaya Pakaragiddare, Yvara Samajika Siddhanta, Kannada Sahitya, Chitra Sahitya, Matto Vikasa Shastra Dali, uh, Vikasa Shastra Vishaya Gadali, Asakti Kundetare. Please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Gaudauru.
Very easy. These ideas, broadly put, represent an extraordinary uh, skepticism and confidence against a very powerful vision of what it means to be modern, and we all know that. Uh, at no point in his thinking, especially after he wrote in Spurge, does he hesitate on this conviction of his. Uh, big technology was being celebrated, he said, in this place of labor, that's what he said. Cities were being celebrated as a place of freedom, he said cities promote vice. And the Gandhian world is actually a world. I mean, there's no aspect of life that hasn't left uh, without offering a reflection on. But this was 100 years ago, and we are now in the 21st century, and it's a very cynical moment that we are all being witnessed. There's no shred of idealism on the world stage. Even the very real threat of climate change doesn't make people really become sincere about what they're trying to do inside the countries. Uh, it's all half-willed diplomatic speak, uh, and everyone knows that. Even the Israel-Palestine conflict, a horrendous conflict that has happened in, our, in front of our own eyes in the last few weeks, you we kept thinking, where is a Gandhi there if you now? If Gandhi were alive, he would have gone there. And I was actually secretly hoping that the Pope would go there, or any other religious authority figure. Now, in this situation, where you have an over-centralized system, where the financial system seems completely opaque and mysterious and large, it's controlling global economies. And the states have become monstrous, they have become overgrown, they are large. And there is a sense of helplessness about what can we do to change the world. The world seems too large and too out of control and too headed on the path of self-destruction. But at the same time, you also notice a restlessness among people. And I think the restlessness is an important one to, to recognize. And that is where think, you see some scope for hope of you know, being able to address that. What is the restlessness about? The restlessness is about environmental catastrophes. People are noticing that the weather these days is not what it used to be. People are also nervous about the food they eat. And people are also nervous about the communities. You know, the loss of community life. Whether you're in Bangalore, a big city like Bangalore, or in a small village, you sense that things are spinning out of control, and you no longer matter. And the Gandhian emphasis on Gram Swaraj, or, you know, local synthesis was preeminently about a group of people who do things that allows them to see themselves as people who matter in what's happening to their lives, right? And you could even think about the new right-wing mobilization you've seen in Europe, in England, in Germany, and even the one here, I would not uh, be easy about this, as a response to a sense of an erosion of community life about the government's not caring too much about how they handle the migration problem, how they handle the thing problem. If you see this film, I forget the name of it, Oak Tree, this is the British, uh, Ken Loach has made this film. And there's one of the line there, where one of the uh, villagers says, why were they settled here and not in the richer neighborhood? And that tells you something about how the, the British government has gone about the settlement process. It's just a top-down decision. They are not considered anyone. There's no sense of fairness about where they will be etc. etc. There, there are problems. And it's not a simple question of, okay, here are the individuals responding in the world. Anyway, now what's to be done? This is a big question. And I don't think uh, it's, it's too complex. But I think one thing, the Gandhian confidence that a vision of urban progress is a bad vision is still something worth uh, continuing. Uh, uh, because if you, you know, I was reading Wendell Berry's The Unsettling of America. This yesterday, I wrote more it today. And he quotes from US Agriculture Department policy documents in the 70s. And if you read it, it will seem like you're reading Nithya Ayog's documents. 
because they are saying the same thing. There are too many people living in villages in America. They, the surplus population has to be transferred out of there to cities. They have to be reskilled, given new employment skills, etc., etc. And you see the same talk happening today, and it's going unquestioned because the vision of an urban India, where 50 percent of Indians will be in the cities in 2050. 80% in 2080, etc. These are facts being thrown at you, and everyone seems to think that they're perfectly fine facts. And each one of these are actually controversial facts, and they should be seen as not settled facts, and these are all open to rethinking and negotiation. So I would love to hear someone come up with a slogan called rebuilding villages and rebuilding cities, where you are not seeing a future has been headed in just one direction alone. And even villages are also changing. It's not a question of them remaining you know, rooted in, in continuing old methods. It's, it's, you know, as we know, villages are also dynamic, they're also changing. And it's not just agriculture alone that they're pursuing. There's a multiple of livelihoods. And there's an extraordinary creative and innovation that you will see if you pay attention, if you travel. They're all trying to respond to a very deeply of crisis in the situation, if you will, but it's not a question of a pop out or a, you know, just giving in and struggle. And the second thing, and here is where I think, you know, the, a, a, a life of limits, if a certain vision of you know, just enjoy life is being laid out in front of us, uh, you know, a very, you ask to be consumers and not feel guilt about it, you know, that's the predominant public attitude, it's okay to make money and okay to spend a lot of money. You don't know anyone, any explanation really. When you look at our sports stars, that's the model that they hold out for the such and such, etc. And, and you know, and a whole generation is being, is evolving with this understanding. But this idea never had sanctity as we know. Something about limitless consumption was always a problem and Gandhi very very clearly understood this and he said over and over again that you have to master your passions, a life of restraint is important, a life of limits is important and he kept saying this is what our saints always knew, our fakirs and rishis knew this all along. And you know one of the things that I'm sure uh, most of us here have recognized is when Gandhi is always very careful to say these are my ideas but not mine alone not mine alone because I've picked them up from observing people around me and I've noticed that Indians think like this and I'm only articulating something that's already there. And I think he was not just uh, making it up as a matter of modesty. I think he really meant it and I really feel the dominant morality here, whatever be its sources, does still resist a certain kind of extravagance you know, in how one lives without limits, without restraint. Restraint is still the value. So the politics that we have to do, etc., we'll have to engage. Because we have because we have grown to part of an education system that has taken us away from certain moral conversations. Remember Gandhi keeps saying to the reader in the Hind Swaraj, uh, look, you try to speak for, for Indians, but you really don't know Indians. Live with them for six months and come back and then you talk. And I think that the response is still valid, uh, you know, as a response to all of us. But who does he mean to live with the people? He means that those who are outside of the charmed, educated circles, the people who are illiterate, quote unquote, who are not part of uh, the class of intelligentsia that we encounter. So I think there is something there for any political uh, responses we may have about today's crisis. As, as, a, as people who work with that we learn from etc. I think mean, it's very, very, very important. And we, in our modernist hubris, you know, we can be modern in the way we respond to modern crises. And therein lies a problem. If wealth distribution happens in egalitarian ways, if we think the problem is solved, then we haven't understood the Gandhian project at all. Because it's not about wealth creation and distribution in an equitable manner. Not that equity didn't matter to him, but that was not a preeminent concern. Wealth does bring with it problems, as you know, as political scientists will tell you. With increased wealth, there's increased garbage. They'll see a, they'll see a correspondence coordinate. 
in very scientific ways. And they've seen it happen in uh, rich countries. But the impact, the onus is to show that that equation is not a necessary uh, equation. I mean, it's not necessary. So I think there's a lot to be done in the way we go about this politics of, in your work, let's not call it politics, in the work of trying to uh, restore some autonomy, full autonomy, semi autonomy to local level arrangements. Uh, we call it a village or a local municipality or a town municipality. It keeps shifting or a state or in relation to the center or India in relation to the West, etc. There are multiple ways of thinking about locality, of course. And so in this case, it's not a question of turning away from the state. We have to work with the state wherever we can. But the state alone can't be your, you can't place all your faith in the state. You have to find creative solutions uh, outside the state. And you know, one of the Gandhian metaphors was that he envisioned India as a porcupine full of quills. In each village fully autonomous and self reliant, and any disturbance they would rise up with. And so that kind of preparedness and confidence in the local level is what he pushed for in his thinking. And I think it is still a viable way to think about how to restore local autonomy. Um, uh, um, Yes, and then, then the way you know, Gandhi refused to think like a political scientist of the state as a state from above. Uh, if you change how people live, the complexion of the state changes, the character of the state changes, and I still think that way of thinking of the state as a result of how people live, rather than a state that arrives from above and decides how people live, is a valuable uh, way of thinking. Um, uh, so, with uh, these words, I would like to uh, thank. I'll wait for the other speakers to further the questions to further there will be a session on that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'd like to thank both the speakers for uh, talking about the global challenges and some of the local solutions. Uh, we would now like to felicitate the speakers. Uh, I request uh, Abhilash, a uh, social activist, to come on stage and uh, present from it to Shri Ar Argan Manamani. pre-recorded videos of speakers who could not uh, come here. Uh, the first one is by Ambassador Akbar Ahmed, uh, who is the Chair of Islamic Studies at American Universities in Washington, D.C., uh, a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He has taught at Princeton, Harvard, and Cambridge, and is hailed by the BBC as the world's leading authority on contemporary Islam. Formerly Pakistan's High Commissioner to the UK and Ireland, Ambassador Ahmed has authored over a dozen award winning books. He is currently exploring the role of America in the conflict between tribe and state in the Muslim world. Namaste, Salaam Alaikum, and greetings. I am grateful to the Honorable Dr. Vishu Kumarji and the Karnataka Gandhi Samarakar Nidhi 
for the invitation to participate in this conference. I'm also grateful to the distinguished Kulkarni Sahib for introducing me to him. My topic is the relevance of Mahatma Gandhi's ideas in the 21st century. I'm deeply honored to be amongst this August gathering, even though it is through the modern miracle of video conferencing. In the brief time allotted to me, I will make three points. First, the 21st century appears to present a very gloomy picture, at least in the minds of the influential thinkers of our time. From Bernard Henri Levy to Yuval Noah Hariri to John Mearsheimer to Henry Kissinger, they point to the devastation brought by climate change the potential dangers of artificial intelligence and the widespread political violence emerging out of ethnic and religious conflicts. Looming over the misery of ordinary lives is what Mearsheimer calls great power rivalry. When the individual is further forgotten and dominated by the vast resources and political power of the hegemonic nations, it is here where the humility and compassion of the Mahatma are more relevant than ever. On top of all this, or perhaps because of it, commentators suggest we may be sleepwalking into a third world war, one that may well end human life as we know it on the planet. My second point is that in order to alleviate this widespread gloom and misery, the world desperately needs universal philosophies to embrace the different sections and shapes of human societies. It is in this context that the ideas and example of Mahatma Gandhi become most relevant. His idea of ahimsa, nonviolence, shanti, peace, and seva, service to the people, and of course, satyagraha, or nonviolent struggle for justice, are the most powerful and relevant aspects of his philosophy for today's world. For me, these values embody his teaching and they're not only for his faith. For example, he embraced the Muslims. This is what makes him a true saint. He went out of his way to show respect and acceptance for the minority. For example, he wrote the foreword to the life of the Prophet of Islam, read from the Holy Quran in his morning prayer and chanted his favorite hymn, which included both Ishwar and Allah. The Mahatma showed once again his inclusive embrace of humanity when even after the bloody and bitter partition in 1947, he declared that he would spend three months of every year in Pakistan. As for him, the peoples of both nations were close to his heart. Mr. Jinnah's response was equally magnificent. He ordered his staff that full protocol be provided for the Mahatma as given to a head of state. Perhaps that is why he was assassinated. But that is precisely what in my eyes and the eyes of millions makes him a superhero for the ages. The Mahatma presents us with the great Indian paradox. If a true aristocrat is to be defined by courtesy and good manners, then the Mahatma was no less than the most refined princes and maharajas of India. His respect and courtesy were legendary in showing grace and courtesy even in times of acrimony and division. He wrote, as we said previously, the foreword to a book on the Holy Prophet of Islam. And he addressed Mr. Jinnah, a political opponent, the title given to him by his supporters, the Qaid Azam. My third point is to ask ourselves, what are the principles of Gandhian behavior we need to remind ourselves of? What are we to extract from a life which was so rich? Despite the shameful attacks on his reputation online, what we need to share and propagate are the great Gandhian virtues of Ahimsa, Shanti and Seva. That is why conferences like this are so important. Not only India, but the world needs these Gandhian values. When we heard the Mahatma was killed, Mr. Jinnah, the Qaid Azam, issued an immediate message of condolence. He used the word great four times to
to describe the Mahatma, adding, the Muslims of India had lost their greatest supporter. Both leaders would have been heartbroken to see the condition and predicament of the minorities in their respective nations. To my mind, the reconciliation of these two great men of history is the inevitable destiny of the subcontinent and will bring peace and harmony to this vast and troubled region of the planet. That is why my latest play, Gandhi and Jinnah Return Home, ends with the last scene of the two giants of the subcontinent embracing and acknowledging each other. He is correctly called the Kaid Azam, says the Mahatma, and Jinnah replies, he is indeed the Mahatma. Our South Asian subcontinent in the last century elevated the Mahatma to an icon and then forgot his true message. We have to all of us revive the essence of his message for the 21st century. He does not need us. We need him. Thank you. <laughs> The last talk of this uh, session is a pre-recorded video of Professor Kwan Yu Shang, who is a distinguished academic at the School of Foreign Studies, South China Non University. He specializes in cross-cultural communication, foreign language education, and Gandhi studies. He has made significant contributions to exploring Mahatma Gandhi's influence in China, particularly the historical and cultural ties between China and India through his Gandhian philosophy. Professor Shang has authored numerous publications, translated key works on Gandhi, and actively promotes a Sino Indian cultural exchange. His work is recognized both in China and internationally, and he frequently participates in lectures and conferences on the impact of Gandhi's ideologies on Chinese society. Mahatma Gandhi's Nonviolence for Building a Peaceful Society authored by Quan Yu Shang, video recorded by Mo Han Shang. Dear Dr. Wuday Krishna, Sri Siddharamaya Ji, Sudhindra Kukani, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, I am very honored to be invited by Kanataka Gandhi Smaraka Nidhi to virtually participate in this important international seminar on the theme Mahatma Gandhi for the 21st century, building a global future of peace, justice, fraternity, and sustainable development. In commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the National Gandhi Smaraka Nidhi. On this occasion, I would like to talk something about Mahatma Gandhi's nonviolence for building a peaceful society. As we know, nonviolence is advocated in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism in its Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain contexts. Nonviolence, that is, ahimsa, stands for not injury to living beings. Gandhi uses this phrase, but gives it a total different new meaning. Gandhi refines its meaning by applying the term to human and social interactions especially, and by introducing the positive connotation of ahimsa as love. For Gandhi, Nonviolence involves not only the negative connotation of refraining from doing injury to any living being, either physical or mentally, but also the positive connotation of extending the love, which one naturally has for one's near relations to all humankind, including one's enemy. It includes the positive connotations of affection, compassion, sympathy, mercy, generosity, service, and self-sacrifice, as well as the negative ones of non-injury and non-harm. In other words, in its positive form, nonviolence means largest love, greatest to charity. Nonviolence as love is regarded by Gandhi as a universal principle on which the very existence of the world and the human society depend. As he said, though the society, the social structure is not based on a conscious acceptance of nonviolence, all the world over humankind lives 
Families are bound together by ties of love, and so are groups in the so-called civilized society called nations. Therefore, nonviolence as love is the law of human species, just as violence is the law of beasts. Nonviolence as love is not the weapon of the weak, but of the strong and brave. It is a moral and soul force, which means to oppose material force with spiritual, spiritual force, to oppose physical force by soul force, to conquer hatred with love, to return good for evil, to move others with self-suffering and self-sacrifice. Gandhi lived in an age full of violence, which made him seek nonviolence as the remedy. Today, the situation in the world is almost the same as in Gandhi's time, if not worse. Violence and conflict, uh, conflict still threaten world peace and humankind's existence. Gandhi's remedy is still valid, or rather more urgent and necessary in today's world. Violence cannot prevent violence. On the, on the contrary, it can only accelerate it. No other way but nonviolence can bring peace to the world and welfare to humankind. It is only through nonviolence that the salvation of humankind is possible. So we should fall back upon the Gandhian philosophy of nonviolence as love, especially Gandhi's doctrine and application of nonviolence not only had a strong influence on the Gandhi's independ uh, Indian independence movement and the 20th century's world as he lived, but also has a far reaching influence in the uh, 30 of uh, 21st century's world, including China after his death. Quite often, many of my Indian friends ask me a question. Being a Gandhian scholar, what do you think is the relevance of Mahatma Gandhi to today's China? With this question in mind, since 2012, I have been researching the topic on Gandhi's studies in China over a century long saga from 1920s to the 21st century. I've written an article, The Relevance of Mahatma Gandhi to China in the uh, 21st century, some cases. For the magazine, India China Chronicle, which is published in November to December 2019, which consists of four parts Mahatma Gandhi's autobiography, Mahatma Gandhi's nonviolence, Mahatma Gandhi's simple living and high thinking, Mahatma Gandhi's pursuit of public good. Therefore, here I would like to share the second part, Mahatma Gandhi's nonviolence, with you. Mr. Bei Ye a Chinese writer, scholar, expert of community issues, under the influence of Mahatma Gandhi's doctrine of nonviolence, applied Gandhi's nonviolent approach to residential community governance so as to safeguard the legal rights of the residents in the community. He put forward a slogan for maintaining legal rights in 2006, that is nonviolence and cooperation by which to make contributions to building up a harmonious society. He wrote, Mahatma Gandhi created miracles by his spirit of pursuing truth via nonviolence and non-cooperation and defeated the powerful British empire by using peaceful methods. We have derived such an inspiration from Mahatma Gandhi as follows. That is, in the process of building up harmonious company, uh, com a community, our slogan is to pursue social justice via nonviolence and cooperation. We are now in a historic transformation period. So we can only create our new life via mutual understanding and caring via nonviolence and cooperation. In Mao's era, there's no such kind of issues in China because at that time, all estate properties belonged to the to state and the government and everyone lived in his or her own working unit apartments are paying by paying very little rental fee. 
the Department of Estate Properties of the working unit took responsibilities for maintaining it. All people lived in their own working unit apartment and buildings, but in a post mouse era, especially in late 1990s and early 21st century, all working units apartments were sold to employees and many more people bought their apartments in newly built residence community areas and moved out of their working unit apartments. Newly built residence community areas were recited with people from different working units and property management company took responsibilities of maintaining all estate properties. So a new kind of conflict appeared between property management companies and property owners in its early stage. On March, two, on March 1st, 2006, CCTV made a TV program called News Pro, the story of property owners maintaining their legal rights. Mr. Baye was one of the three interviewees who were either current or previous heads of three different residence community areas in Beijing. It, it is said that when it came to the topic concerning property owners maintaining their legal rights, one could not help having pictures of contradictions and conflicts between property owners and property management companies a state property developer occurred in mind. There were many court cases and some violent incidents. Why residents' community areas became battlefields rather than places to live in peace? How to maintain property owners' legal rights when violated? What are the ultimate goals of maintaining property owners' legal rights? In Mr. Bayes' opinion, he acts of maintaining property owners' legal rights is a scholar civil experiment. He starts from ex, uh, uh, claims for his own and his neighbor's legal rights and it gradually moves on to focus on public affairs within his residence community. And finally, upgrades to ponder over issues of maintaining legal rights of the whole society each week he organizes a virtual education seminar in his apartment, discussing topic concerning virtual education. He believes that virtual education is an integral part of civil education and the cultivation of awareness of civic obligations is the indispensable prerequisite for maintaining property owners' legal rights. Through nonviolent actions such as talk and negotiation, the conflict between property management companies and property owners is solved peaceful, uh, peacefully. Mr. Bayes residence community is rewarded an excellent one in Beijing. Nowadays, there is seldom news about violate, uh, violent incidents in uh, residential community areas. Mr. Baye keeps on promoting Mahatma Gandhi's thoughts. In his article published on website, he wrote, I believe we can learn a lot of meaningful things from Mahatma Gandhi and India's modernization road, especially some substantially spiritual things, just like our ancestors did when they went to India to get Buddhism. Mahatma Gandhi is our mentor and his spirit is a good remedy for China's society. Those who are longing for the recovery of humanity and progress of soul can get inspiration and strength from Gandhi's works. I hope to organize a Gandhi fans club on my website so we can keep in touch and exchange ideas. This is what Mr. Baye did in earlier 21st century in China. I think I have to stop my talk now. Thank you so much for your patience and attention.